Good afternoon and welcome to the Urban and Regional Planning Speaker Series, Beyond Greenways. My name is Michelle Garza and I lead the Urban and Planning Student Association, uh, working with Sam Rueda, a UTS, US, UTSA's Urban and Regional Planning Professional Development Chair, and Dr. Wei Zhai, our faculty advisor, and Dr. Esteban Lopez Ochoa, both URP professors. We are happy to bring you this event um, with Robert Cerns. He's gonna to speak to us today about Greenways and his experience and lessons learned from his new book, Beyond Greenways. We're also really excited to welcome new, our local panelist, um, Brandon Ross from the City of San Antonio Parks and Recreation Department. He's gonna be talking about the Howard Peak Greenway Trails. Then we are happy to welcome also Rebecca Krug from the San Antonio River Authority. And she's going to be talking to us today about her project, Westside Creek's Ecosystem Restoration. And then uh, lastly, we have Sky Kurd, a local community uh, member from the Westside Creek Oversight Committee. And she's going to be talking about um, her role as the co-chair of the Ecosystem Restoration Project Oversight Committee. So as urban and regional planning master student and faculty at UTSA, the reason we want to put on these events um, and you know why we study urban and regional planning is to really better understand how to collaborate with our partners and community members to create a healthier and more resilient, equitable, and environmentally and socially just community. One way to achieve many of these goals is to ensure equitable access to healthy greenways through this seminar, we hope that you gain a, a deeper understanding of the role greenways have in our community, what work is being done locally, and how you can get involved. Now I'm excited to introduce Robert Stearns. Thank you, Michelle. So really quick, maybe I can just give a little overview of your, your illustrious career. Robert has a four-decade history of visualizing, planning, and getting trails and greenway projects built. He was project director of Denver's Platte River and Mary Carter Greenways, both national award-winning projects. He helped plan the Grand Canyon National Park Greenway, played a key role on the Memphis Wolf River Greenway. He co-authored Greenways, a guide to planning, design, and development, and contributed to Greenways, the beginning of an international movement. His most recent book, Beyond Greenways, published by Island Press, is cited by the American Society of Landscape Architects, is one of the 10 best books in 2023. He has written for Planning, Landscape, Architecture, LA China, and American Trails magazines. He has been a keynote speaker in the United States and Asia, and a trainer for the US National Park Service and the Urban Land Institute. He has chaired American Trails and was a founder of the World Trails Network, as well as being a delegate to the America's Great Outdoor White House Conclave. He resides, writes, and hikes and bikes near Denver, which is why he's coming us today virtually. Robert, take it away. Thank you, Michelle. My pleasure. And we'll, we'll go ahead to the next slide. Thank you. And, and in our discussions uh, prior to the session, uh, we talked about uh, the evolution of greenways uh, in a more general way and some of the kinds of challenges uh, that we look at. And um, this includes, uh, first and foremost, in my mind, providing a great recreational experience. Uh, in some ways, I like to say we're really ultimately in the entertainment business we wanna compose a great experience uh, when we design and build these facilities um, for the people that, that will use them. And we uh, wanna emphasize the notion of diverse, equitable access to all the facilities that we build. Um, we're always concerned and put at the forefront issues of safety, crime, uh, climate factors, and particularly just feeling safe, the perception of feeling safe and secure uh, when you're out using an outdoor facility. We want what we build uh, to be sustainable uh, and ecologically uh, compatible with the surroundings. Uh, I always like to say we want to leave it better than we found it, the setting where we, we build these improvements. 
Uh, we want to look at, of course, affordability and whether it's practical to implement the ideas that we visualize. Um, we always want to be aware of the community and public input and know what the community wants. And communities have all kinds of different sectors of groups with different interests. So we want to have a broad net that we cast uh, to get as wide uh, a range of input from people as we can. We always want to design with operations and maintenance uh, involved. If, we, if, if you can't maintain it, uh, I think we don't build it. So, so that's a very important thing too, is O&M. And then uh, connectivity. Uh, that uh, acts, that's not only accessibility, but linking to places, other systems, and even some of these corridors, uh, in fact, foremost, some of these corridors uh, should be uh, active travel routes. And by active travel, I mean traveling by foot or by bicycle, non-motorized means uh, that also promote fitness uh, to get to our destinations, whether it's work or a, a friend's house or a corner restaurant or a library. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about the evolution of what I like to think of green space as an adaptive urban form. Uh, really, for millennia, uh, you know, since we've we've had cities, um, people have thought about how we can have uh, places of relief and solace uh, from our day to day world. Uh, in our environment. And this goes back even to the boulevards of ancient China uh, and also thinking about what evolved in the parkways and then the Greenway ecological movement. And uh, lastly, I'll talk about where I see it going today. Next slide. And as I said, ancient China uh, they were laying these places out. It, people could just get out into a civic space. Uh, later on, uh, we have the boulevards of France that are probably one of the most famous examples of the boulevard notion. These were uh, wonderful civic spaces with greenery and places for people to promenade and see each other. Uh, that idea then came to North America, um, even when Washington, D.C. was laid out. Uh, and many other cities have boulevards, just beautiful landscape places uh, where people could be out and about. And the next logical step from that was uh, when Olmsted brought the next generation uh, of parkways. Uh, and this was in you know about 130 or 40 years ago when uh, Frederick Law Olmsted introduced the notion of parkways, which really was an adaptation of the boulevard concept uh, where he believed in connecting uh, civic spaces and parks together with beautifully landscaped parkways. Uh, one of the great examples uh, is in Buffalo, New York. Uh, there's other ones uh, all around the country uh, of Olmsted uh, corridors that people used. And an interesting thing, I, I know I mentioned the notion of people seeking uh, solace and relief with green infrastructure. And back in the uh, mid and late uh, 19th century, it was an era of industrialization. Uh, you know, many of the people were working in grimy places, factories and places. And, and so they could get out of that kind of gray existence into greenery. And, and that's what Olmsted saw. He was very interested in public health and the health and well being of the population. And then we look at the next stage. Uh, which uh, I like to call the third generation of greenways. And uh, in my opinion, that started around the mid 70s and it's still evolving. It, it's become a worldwide movement. There are greenways just about everywhere now. And I think greenways were a counterpoint, a green counterpoint to uh, the domination of the automobile, which after the 1950s uh, really began to become you know, kind of another form of almost oppression in our outdoor spaces, the noise and the barriers and not being able to move about safely because automobiles were everywhere. And greenways uh, began to follow uh, river corridors and stream corridors and abandoned rail lines, 
which uh, were in a way separated from automobile traffic. So they were kind of a, a place of relief from and solace, green solace from the automobile uh, dominated world. And as we look at the next slide, um, we're going to talk about um, how greenways have transformed spaces as well in urban areas. Many of our urban streams and waterways just kind of became forgotten and dilapidated. And then we can see in the next slide, the transition, uh, the dramatic transition. This is the same place that uh, making these kind of places, people places uh, can do. And then as we, we go forward, uh, we're going to look at um, kind of a, you know, is the Greenway's evolution part B, which is really looking beyond just recreation, but at ecological greenways and multi-objective projects where we began to look at greenways, not only as recreation, but as uh, broader green infrastructure in terms of uh, a number of different kinds of benefits. And, and let's look at some of those. Water management, uh, you know, in terms of how water flows and keeping it clean, water quality, uh, creating wetlands and places to store water and what we call polishing water. In other words, removing some of the contaminants. Uh, greenways could also function uh, as flood control spaces. Uh, there's a whole movement um, that was initiated by Kung Jian Yu, in a landscape architect in China, uh, but other uh, urbanists have picked this up, where we think of cities as more absorptive places rather than just paved over with impermeable surfaces. And there's been a, a really wide movement in China and other, other places now to create uh, broader open spaces uh, and landscaping along the edges of roads uh, with greenery and uh, surfaces that can absorb runoff water as a way to reduce flooding and, and even vast wetlands being set aside. Uh, there are also places to create urban, for urban forestry. These might be forest no nodes, uh, you know, kind of little micro forests or mini, mini forested areas in cities, or even the landscaping along the edges uh, where flora and fauna can, can flourish. So that's another benefit. And of course, there's the health and healing consideration. Uh, as a spinoff of the Greenway movement, uh, just getting people out exercising more, feeling healthier, both uh, physically and mentally. Uh, connectivity, and by connectivity here, I mean linking communities and people together, uh, being able to move around in the environment and also connecting uh, different habitat areas together. Uh, routes of migration, there's even been a whole movement of these larger uh, greenways, these mega greenways, uh, particularly where uh, wildlife, bird life can uh, circulate and migrate to find food, to find breeding grounds, uh, and the other benefits that come with being able to travel across what uh, has become an increasingly fragmented landscape because of road building and, and other barriers. Greenways can actually also serve as emergency access and egress routes. Sometimes in emergencies, uh, the street system can be just totally blocked. And that's where these pathways and trails along rail lines and rivers and so on might be ways that emergency vehicles uh, can move about the city. Environmental education and uh, the notion of stewardship and instilling that uh, is another kind of spinoff opportunity of this phase B of greenways, and even uh, places for hunting and fishing uh, can be, uh, can be in integrated into greenways as we look at them as they're evolving. And then let's take a look at yet another, another level of uh, evolution. Uh, before we do that though, let's consider the alternative futures uh, that the greenway movement has uh, put in front of us. This is kind of typical of what it was like uh, back in the 1970s uh, along many urban rivers and streams. And Greenways has transformed this, uh, as we'll see in the next slide, into uh, where there are opportunities. Um, we, we can go beyond this notion of channelizing 
uh, things with concrete just to carry water from here to there to greenways being uh, a differently designed space for um, our waterways. And the next slide, uh, let's take a look at that image of you know really what things could be looking like <clears throat> in the future uh, rather than these single purpose engineered solutions that that we saw uh, that hopefully we're evolving out of. Um, and let's look at the next slide. We also can improve the opportunity for water recreation and in the process improve uh, waterways for uh, the aquatic creatures, the fish and the insects and the bird life. This is kind of typical of what waterways were looking like uh, a generation back and some places sadly it still does. Uh, but we've looked at ways too to translate uh, trans transform those waterways, uh, design solutions that allow us to, uh, as we'll see in the next slide, uh, get uh, a greener solution that's a win-win. Not only can recreationalists uh, go through these uh, dams that we've designed uh, for paddling and recreation, uh, but also the fish can migrate uh, this way um, instead of dams being uh, a blockade that, that prohibits that movement and that connectivity. Next slide, please. Um, this illustration shows just a, a really easy way of looking at that. Um, this was the typical trapezoidal uh, kind of tunnel vision engineering solution that we saw kind of in those concrete channels I showed earlier. Um, but we can look at terraced solutions as the next slide will show. Uh, it, it's just a, a, it's not that complicated, just having different levels, which is what nature does to allow different kinds of vegetation and stream edge riparian habitat to evolve. Next slide, please. So we can also think of the human impact. Uh, this is kind of typical of what we saw a generation ago, and we still see it in places. Uh, kids just don't have access to these, you know, kind of landscapes, these play landscapes that can get them back in touch with nature. Greenways can allow that alternative solution when we think in terms of trapezoidal channel design and uh, other types of, of collaborative efforts between landscape architects, planners, and engineers. And let's look at the next slide. Um, Places, places that are a different kind of alternative future. Next slide, please. And, and again, that, that view of really what we wanna strive for as we think about ecological greenways. Next slide, please. And it's a great opportunity also for volunteer and educational activities. Uh, this is a project that we did uh, near Denver uh, along Sand Creek next to uh, an oil refinery, actually. And what we did is we did that trapezoidal channel design where we laid back terraces. And then uh, we arranged with a bunch of school kids uh, and their parents and teachers to come in and replant this area with the various appropriate uh, wetland species. In the next slide, you'll see uh, there's, there's the kids. Uh, building pride and, and building a better future for themselves. And the next slide shows, um, you know, how that area has changed just through that effort of just thinking a little differently. It's, it's not that hard to do. It's, it's just getting out of silo thinking, thinking about uh, all the different benefits in a more holistic way. Next slide, please. Um, and here's some volunteers improving uh, trout fishery habitat in streams just by notching uh, drop structures that allow the fish to migrate. And again, it benefits more than just the fish. Uh, it benefits the uh, all the bird life and the animals and the other critters that, that live along these corridors. And next slide, please. Uh, again, a, 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 it's just aesthetically more pleasing too to have this this kind of, of look. Next slide, please. And of course, the recreational benefits. Next slide, please. 
We also uh, can think of this in the way we design our communities. We've had uh, the more traditional way of laying out development uh, where each lot is isolated and all the space is taken up. The alternatives to cluster to create a greenway space uh, by combining uh, the uh, occupied areas into clustered uh, so residential development and then preserving a recreational amenity, which actually makes these properties more valuable, makes the communities more marketable. Uh, there's so many benefits from coming, coming from just thinking about this ahead of time and this notion of connectivity. Next slide, please. And this is a cross section of uh, how we might think about that in a residential development. Again, that tor uh, terraced notion uh, we like to imagine uh, our spaces, I like to see at least three tree canopies wide uh, so that we can have the uh, bird life and the other creatures that live in the treetops. It also provides screening uh, for the people that maybe enjoy a trail along this corridor. You kind of fit the trail in as the slide shows. Uh, and those trees and vegetation kind of screen the surrounding development so you have a more natural feel. Next slide, please. And this is an example. This is a project, uh, Ken Carroll Ranch, uh, where I happen to live, where the housing was clustered and the uh, a greenway was created by uh, setting aside that open space. It's just getting ahead of it and thinking of it ahead of time. Next slide, please. And of course, these corridors are opportunities for artistic and cultural expression. And we always want that in the package uh, when we think of evolving greenways. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna take a look at the next generation um, that uh, I've been thinking about and I wrote about in my book, um, the notion of a different kind of geometry uh, that we can add as a layer, uh, increasing accessibility. And I call them grand loops and town walks. And uh, let's talk a little bit about that. We know that uh, walking and increasingly we're seeing articles just all over the place about the health benefits, just the simple way you can feel better just by walking routine routinely. Um, there's so many ways, just mental, spiritual, uh, cardiovascularly. Uh, we, we can think about just better thinking. I know I get some of my, my ideas when I'm out just going for a walk, helping you sleep better. Uh, there's just so many benefits uh, that uh, longevity. There, there's even articles that say it can help stave off uh, Alzheimer's. So um, how do we do that? How do we accomplish that benefit of uh, having these increased spaces? Yes, we have the greenways and rail trails and things like that, but they're, they're kind of limited to those corridors. And so I'm kind of proposing, let's, let's go beyond that, put another layer in. Next slide, please. But this does take infrastructure to do it. Next slide, please. And this different geometry, um, is is doable. And there's a number of reasons why it might even, even be more doable in some ways than more traditional greenways and uh, multi-use urban trails, the, the paved, mostly paved urban trails that, that have been built over the past uh, generation or so. Next slide, please. Um, I'm thinking here more about walking for these kinds of facilities. It doesn't mean that uh, bikes can't be part of it or bikes are prohibitive. I just think it's for each community to think about that uh, but and how they want to do it and make those decisions. But by walking, I mean hiking, trekking, running, uh, all the different modes of foot travel uh, that that people can engage in. Next slide, please. So anyway, the two elements, as I mentioned earlier, um, that I'm proposing is one is Grand Loop Trails, uh, which is kind of the evolution of greenways where we have a, a trail or a greenway that wraps around the edges of a city where the city meets the countryside. Uh, one of my colleagues kind of described it as, as taking the Appalachian Trail and wrapping it around a city. 
Um, it's it's out on the edges, um, but because it's right on the edges of a city, you can easily get to it. Uh, and it almost becomes kind of the beginnings of a green belt. Uh, it's an urban defining kind of thing, a trail that uh, goes all around the city along the edges. Um, and then we can see those as linking uh, some of the green nodes that already tend to exist out on the edges of cities. Many cities have state parks and county parks and larger preserve areas out on the edges. We could maybe tie those together with a Grand Loop uh, trail that uh, would be almost kind of like an emerald necklace. Uh, and then the other uh, end of the spectrum would be closer in uh, what I call town walks, because we want to really encourage for health benefits and just enjoyment, daily access every day, routine access to uh, places to just enjoy the outdoors. And so I propose town walks, which are also loops like the Grand Loop, uh, but they're smaller and they connect neighborhoods, civic spaces and social destinations. Um, and I, I think of all of these as kind of a new kind of overlay park. A Grand Loop Trail might be kind of a regional overlay park, whereas the uh, town walks could be like the community parks, neighborhood parks, uh, even like a vest park. There even be doorstep uh, walks. Um, again, Grand Loops where city meets countryside. Um, I've proposed a number of different types of uh, configurations. Um, and, and it can go way beyond this. It's really up to your own creativity to figure out these things. Uh, one can be uh, trails that stay on the edges of cities. Some might be hybrids that go into the city area, uh, but then out to the countryside. Uh, we can create wedges out to the edges by using the existing trails and greenway networks and have connections that follow them out to a grand loop on the edge of town. Uh, some folks I've talked to have even proposed a daisy chain of sub loops, which are smaller loops. Some of these might be actually mountain biking parks or equestrian riding areas. So the options are really up to your creativity in terms of what you want to see happen. At first I thought, oh, maybe this idea is just crazy. Uh, but when I started to research it, uh, I noticed there's one in Phoenix. Las Vegas is building one. Louisville is building one. There's one in Reed. Rio de Janeiro, Rio de Janeiro uh, which is pretty amazing. Portland actually, with the Olmsteads, uh, developed one over 100 years ago called the 40 mile loop that they're building on. And then I did a series of thought experiments looking at these around some different cities. Uh, and uh, I'll get into that in the Q&A later. Michelle, let me know if I'm going too long to give me a five minute shout. I don't wanna take other people's time. Paris is actually building one called the Little Belt which follows an old rail line uh, in Paris, which is a, a loop of greenery there. And these can be an alternative, the Grand Loops, to the more crowded, hard to get to outdoor destinations, national parks, national forests, that are increasingly overcrowded and it's just harder to get to them. Uh, they're not, and they're not accessible to a lot of people. Um, town walks are for everyday outings, routine exercise and solace, as I mentioned. It's really something you need to do every day. I walk every single day, rain or shine. Uh, and it's just the health benefits have just been amazing. Um, these town walks can take different configurations. Here's a few I suggest. I'm sure you might have lots of other ways to do these. Destination ones are focused on maybe some iconic destination. Maybe it's a loop around the state capitol uh, or a loop around a particular historic or iconic place in town. Uh, community ones are kind of like community parks. They might be uh, more tricked out, fancy walking loops uh, that you can get to within maybe 10, 15 minutes of your home. And then maybe door, not maybe, certainly doorstep walks. Every doorstep should be a trailhead where you just walk out your door and you have a walking loop. You can create these yourself. Sometimes in many communities, the uh, infrastructure is not there. So we need policies to expand walkability with not only having walks that get you from here to there, but pleasant spaces that are, are gonna make people wanna use them. That's key. These can configure in many ways, as I said, we can have uh, larger loops. Maybe it's a 
10K walk for the more ambitious people. I read about a 70 year old guy the other day that's walking 10 to 14 miles a day or sub loops that maybe are 3K or less, just so you get that daily activity. We can maybe attach them and, whoops, attach them and hang them off of greenways. Uh, and so they become sub loops off of existing greenways. We might attach them to transit stops. So you can take the transit, if a train or a bus to a stop, and do a loop in an area and then hop on the uh, train or the bus to go to the next place. So there's all kinds of options. But again, the goal is to make every doorstep a trailhead. Uh, one example I really like is one in Tucson called the Turquoise Trail uh, that two ladies uh, with the Historic Society and they got a hold of some paint the city had and it was simple as just painting a stripe uh, along the sidewalks into a loop around historic Tucson. And if you guys go to Tucson, uh, it's the way to experience that city. But certainly in San Antonio or any other place, this is a basic way that just a few citizens and a, and a little bit of paint and obviously getting some community cooperation can build these things. Or you can go fancy like Denver's proposed 5280 trail. This might be a $100 million grand loop a destination loop around core Denver. Uh, and the funding is now in place to get that one started. So there's all different levels too in between that you can do. Um, as I said, greenways are linear, rivers, uh, ridge, ridge lines, rails and trails. I like to say they follow the grain of the train that's defined by topography. Grand loops um, go against the uh, grain and town walks do too. Uh, they are, because they're loops, they, they have a different shape, but I think that brings more access and connectivity to people. And uh, with a foot trail emphasis, foot travel emphasis, they may be a little bit easier to build, you know, when you're going against the grain. Uh, you shape them by the opportunity and the experience that's available. Uh, they can link uh, nodes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like around Phoenix and other places, into a daisy chain. So they're kind of the beginning of green belts in a way, too, or a green charm bracelet. Maybe they connect uh, state parks or open space preserves uh, on the edges of cities. So there's lots of ways that this can be done, forming networks. And uh, the key is that they can provide and should provide diverse, equitable access uh, to different ages, abilities, uh, income groups, ethnic groups, so that everybody feels comfortable using these. And I'll talk a little bit about the accessibility thing a little bit later. That's a little bit more of a challenge with grand loops, but there's ways around it. Um, and there's the notion of also lightweight and ultra light uh, travel, which is an emerging kind of trend now that instead of carrying a 50 pound backpack, we want to find ways to travel just with a day pack, maybe some water and a snack and just the basics that you need. So you're not burdened, uh, particularly just some people don't have the physical capability to carry a heavy pack too. And one of the things that, uh, that Grand Loops can allow you to do because they're on the edges of town, there are a lot of hamlets and, and, villages and smaller cities on the edges of larger cities, and they have hotels and B&Bs. So you can plot a route and you don't have to build a campsite. Um, you can even hop a Lyft or an Uber back home at night and then go back again the next day. Or maybe one day we'll see the equivalent of food trucks that come out and set up a campsite. So there's a whole industry that can grow around that. But because they're close in, they allow ultralight travel. Uh, even more importantly is preserving the legacy of the right to roam. Increasingly, we're losing access to open spaces and we're getting more and more confined, whether it's by freeways or no trespassing signs, more and more we're seeing that limitation. Building these things is also all about the experience. I said at the end of the day, I like to think I'm in the entertainment business. We wanna put on a good show, compose a good tune. Uh, it's not just about getting from here to there. People need to enjoy that experience. And one of the things that's interesting about building these kinds of systems is the notion of perception. Uh, really, you have to get inside the head of the people that are going to use these. You don't necessarily have to have a huge expanse of open space to have an open space experience. 
Um, you can all, often within a 50 to 300 foot wide space, create the sense of being in the wilderness by, by planting trees and shrubs and vegetation that screen the surrounding areas and create that sense of ruralness or wilderness kind of feel. And in places you can have the long views uh, through different scenic conservation programs. The Appalachian Trail does this, uh, where you do have those iconic vistas and rural landscapes that you also want to preserve as well. But you don't have to, it, it's not, it shouldn't stop you from building a corridor because maybe there's development around it. It's how you treat that those doors of perception uh, along the way. So these are just some characteristics of routes that we design and build. Obviously, I said it's got to be pleasant and stimulating. Waypoints are really important. Uh, little mini destinations, little nodes where you stop along the way that give you a little destination. Um, and uh, they connect things together that people might do daily, even just going to the coffee shop or the library or rec center. Um, and um, those waypoints should be strategically placed. Uh, so you don't have to carry a lot of water with you or food uh, amenities. Uh, and, and, you know, you uh, maybe it's just a 7-Eleven where you can stop and get something to eat. And then there's character districts. Think about as you're composing your tune, your, your melody, the different kind of spaces. It might be an urban space. It might be a rural space. It might be an artistic kind of bohemian space. Uh, see what you got there. The tread can really vary because we're emphasizing, emphasizing walking. It doesn't have to be a paved concrete surface in building these systems. It can be, but there's many other options, even snow uh, in the, uh, well, we have a lot of it here in Denver, uh, in, in the North country. So there are those options. Um, ideally, I like to see a quarter um, where two people can walk side by side. My, my colleague, Tony Boone, he's a trail builder, calls it WWHH, which means, well, walking hand in hand. So um, it's just a nice way if we want to have a good experience. You can't always achieve this, but it's a goal. Um, and ideally separating the bike uses and the ped uses so you get that flow uh, the walkers have that flow of not worrying about a bike coming up behind them, and the bikers have that flow, which is a different speed than walkers. So that's something to take into account. Uh, these are some typical cross sections. Uh, my colleague Dan Burden talks about this with complete streets, having a tree median, uh, really thinking about that space that buffers you from the automobile traffic. Um, but speaking of automobiles, Many times, this system can actually use streets. Uh, there are many streets in, in cities and towns with low volumes and low speeds where you can just walk in the street. And people are doing it already. You just want to make sure it's safe um, and have a plan if those, those streets get busier. I talked about the creature comforts and necessities. Um, some are very basic, but some people just don't think about some of these things. Uh, particularly restrooms come to mind. Um, if you're out for a trek, you, you need, sometimes you've got to just stop and take care of nature. Shelter and shade, particularly with climate change, uh, and places to duck out if a storm comes up, and places to camp for the night, but maybe it's not a campsite, but, you know, maybe you plan it so there's B&Bs along the way. Um, it, it's all in the way you plan it, but we want to overcome the notion of range anxiety. To get people out using it, they need to feel that they can find those uh, kinds of amenities. And wayfinding is key. People need that security of knowing where they're going, finding their way. Uh, and wayfinding does not need to be complex. I don't like relying totally on the well, mobile we just have a few more You know, this is to get away from looking at your, your cell phone. So I, I think very basic, simple Wayfinding can be provided. It might be like the ladies did in Tucson, just turquoise paint, or it could be a, a simple sign, or it might be something embossed into the pavement that tells you where you are or where you're going. This is the Kamano Koto Trail below. Uh, they went big time with their wayfinding. Uh, with, uh, this is a great walking route, by the way, in Japan. And this has, uh, you know, it's kind of an iconic megalith that, that uh, attracts you, but it's wayfinding. So you can go at all levels. 
And then as I talked about the creature comforts along the way, pretty obvious. Just think about all the things you might need if you're out for a couple hours uh, in the, on a sunny day or even not a sunny day. Um, and they should be convenient and regularly spaced. Um, they could be provided by the parks department or a public agency, or it might be as simple as a, a, a Wendy's or somewhere, you know, where you can stop and for the cost of buying, uh, you know, something to drink, uh, you have access to the restroom, you know, be flexible in how you think about that. We want to think about these as being accessible. Uh, in the case of Grand Loops, there are sometimes these are more wildernessy kind of trails. Uh, they may not always be accessible to all people, but then what we do is try and provide an alternate route uh, that is accessible that maybe goes around some of those tight spots. So there are ways to uh, do this. Michelle, let me know if I'm, you know, and I got about three or four minutes left that I, I don't want to go too long here. Yeah, we're, uh, there's we're the about question ready to of getting up. people engaged. A lot of people uh, don't participate. There are tens of millions of people who don't regularly exercise. How do we get those people to engage? Bob, can you hear me? Yes, I can. We're about ready to wrap up this section whenever you are. Okay, I will do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm there. So Thank anyway, you. we'll talk about some of these other issues, uh, some of these kinds of attractions, the use of Lyft and Uber to get around um, and um, getting across critical barriers. And uh, these are an investment, they pay off. Um, and uh, $4 trillion in healthcare cost savings. And, and I just wanna say in Texas, there's a $47.6 billion outdoor recreation economy. So these things are investments. And um, thank you, Michelle. And um, we, uh, I, I will hand it off to the uh, other panelists. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Bob. And we can go back to any of those slides um, no as worries. the questions come up. Um, you bet. As we reset in here, um, I'll just quickly introduce these guys, unless you guys want to quickly introduce yourself if you think that, that would be easier. So Brandon, do you want to go first? Sure. You want to oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Is it on? It's on. OK. Uh, I'm Brandon Ross. I'm with the San Antonio Parks Department. And um, did everybody get a brochure? Um, OK, so I'm going to just talk real quickly about uh, kind of some of the things Bob said. and how they fit within our, our local context to the greenways that I'm working on. Uh, Howard Peake was uh, mayor back in the late uh, 1990s and early 2000. He got the first uh, sales tax money in San Antonio that was specifically dedicated to the greenways. And then the voters thankfully approved that uh, three other times after that. And now we're bond funded. So we've had plenty of money coming into this program. Uh, we've built 102 miles worth of trails to date, and we've got another 30 miles in design and, uh, and more. We've got a, a couple of miles under construction and, and more to come after that. Uh, thankfully, it's been very, very well supported by the San Antonio public, the voters and the city council and, and the, the leadership all around in, in Bear County as well. Um, so. Like I said, we're, I guess, on the grand loop idea, that's sort of what we're playing at here. Um, it's kind of like the wedges to edges was one of the diagrams that Bob showed a minute ago. Uh, I, I would just say structurally, what we're, what we're trying to do is do the loop around the city, which goes through a lot of densely populated neighborhoods. In addition to the actual loop around the city, there's also the West Side Creeks which are in the middle of the city, which um, Rebecca and Sky are, are gonna speak to in just a minute about the restoration of the West Side Creeks. But um, the West Side Creeks tie in with the, the Mission Reach and the rest of the San Antonio River trails that go up into the River Walk and north along the Museum Reach. And so we've been able to thus far tie the Leon Creek Greenway Trail System, which is on the, on the far west side up with the Salado Creek Greenway system on the north and the east side to create what's now a 40 mile continuous segment of trail there. Um, there's about 38 miles if you go from the Medina River Natural Area all the way past Casson Lake and Mitchell Lake and up onto the Mission Reach and so forth and go up through downtown and in, either into the west side or up to Brackenridge Park. So that, that's another really great connected piece and we're just kind of piecing these things together piece by piece here. 
Um, we're still working on connecting through Fort Sam Houston. San Antonio River Authority is working with Bear County funding. They've Bear County's come to the table with money to try to help us get some of these other segments built on Leon uh, South and Salado South. And um, we're, we're just basically plugging away. I know uh, quality was also something that Bob talked about, and we're always uh, trying to up our game in terms of trailhead amenities and in terms of tree plantings. Um, thankfully, the Parks Department is stewards to the Tree Mitigation Fund. So when developers come in and chop down trees, which they have, have a bad habit of doing, they pay into the uh, mitigation fund, and we get the benefits of that money so that we can turn around and, and plant a lot of trees uh, in place of the trees that were lost, uh, inch for inch. Um, we, we plant those trees, provide irrigation to those trees, and that's now incorporated almost every project that we do in terms of both the greenway trails and the parks in San Antonio. Uh, that's a major component now of what we're doing. So shade, of course, is really important. That was something else he talked about. Um, we're Texas heat, everybody knows how hot it is and everything like that. So during the summer, especially, we're trying to provide a lot of shade in, in trees and shade structures and other types of amenities. We've got great partnerships in San Antonio between the county and San Antonio River Authority and the Parks Department at the city and even the Public Works Department. We're trying to now try to branch into street connections um, to bike lanes and shared use paths along our major roadways and different kind of complete streets ideas where all these things start to tie together so that we're creating a connected network of bike and pedestrian mobility around the city of San Antonio. Uh, one of our goals at the Parks Department at the city of San Antonio is to create a 10 minute walk to every park, like for every resident to be able to have a 10 minute walk to a park. We already have like 260 parks in San Antonio. So, you know, we have a lot of park availability, but we're trying to make it more equitable more availability for people to be able to walk and to be able to enjoy themselves without having to be dependent upon a vehicle. So that's my five minute spiel and I'll give it to Rebecca. Thank you, Brandon. I think I'm just gonna sit for mine, if you don't mind. <laughs> so um, I'm Rebecca Krug. I'm the senior project manager for the Westside Creeks Ecosystem Restoration Project. Uh, the San Antonio River Authority is the non-federal sponsor. Our federal sponsor is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And this project, the idea for the project started close to 20 years ago. And my counterpart, Sky, is going to be talking about that in just a minute. But I wanted to talk about the, the overall ecosystem restoration project and tying it back to uh, Robert's presentation. I made a few notes. Um, one of the first ones he mentioned, water is typically viewed as a nuisance in the city. And that is the case with the channelization of the West Side Creeks. So San Antonio as a whole, and especially on the West Side, over decades have experienced um, catastrophic flooding, loss of life, and the San Antonio Channel Improvements Project, which started in the 50s, completed about the late 1980s, um, was the sole purpose to channelize naturally occurring streams. So there are four creeks on the west side that that larger watershed drain into the San Antonio River. And so those four creeks are Alisson Creek, Martinez Creek, San Pedro Creek, and Apache Creek. And those that were historically naturally meandering through the west side communities and um, people used to be able to access them for, for fishing and gathering other herbs and things and just overall recreation and community gathering space um, for the purposes of, of mitigating loss of life and future significant flood impacts to that area, those creeks were channelized into that trapezoidal shape um, image that Robert shared in his presentation. So water as a nuisance, trying to convey it as quickly as possible out of the community. And it, it served that benefit to remove those floodwaters quickly from the neighborhoods However, it did uh, had some other unintended consequences. It disconnected neighborhoods. It, it took out streets and you know easy, easy pathways that people used to be able to walk across the creek or in, through shallow sections to get to the other side. Now are these very wide channels and that really created a lot of disconnectedness. And um, also the ecosystem, the natural habitat that existed historically is no longer there. So 
the one of the, the primary goals of the ecosystem restoration, this federal project that was funded in 2022 with um, president budget funding as well as bipartisan infrastructure law funding um, to restore the four west side creeks to a more natural state. So we're going to be restoring the creeks by creating a more healthier aquatic ecosystem and having native vegetation, woody vegetation, as well as prairie grasses and other forbs to attract beneficial wildlife. Primarily the species of concern, the feasibility study was looking at was um, migratory avian species. The San Antonio area is in the central flyway. So creating extra habitat for those birds to rest on the way through their migration. Um, another topic that Robert mentioned was healthy benefits um, of walking. So the west side has a, this was part of the feasibility study that was done in like 2012, um, well before the project became official, officially funded. They did some research on the west side community and found that they have much higher rates of childhood obesity and, and other health problems. So the ecosystem component is, an, is a very important one of the federal project, but there's also a component of environmental justice and providing access to nature and through the trails that have already been constructed and additional amenities that are going to be added recreational features with the project. They're going to allow the West Side community to come back, enjoy the creeks, have the opportunity to glean some health benefits and enjoy nature. Um, and that also goes into the, the third bullet I had wrote, written down from his presentation about equity and diversity. And I think that would be a good segue to uh, the function of the oversight committee within the project and kind of how the desire to restore the creeks came about. Hi, everybody. I'm Sky. Um, I'm actually one of the co-chairs for the San Antonio River Authority Oversight Committee for the West Side Creeks. How I, I, I grew up in the West Side. Um, my house is literally right behind the Apache Creek. Uh, my, it was my grandmother's house. I inherited it. Um, and I just grew up now give a background about the West Side at that time. It was just primarily it was a low income neighborhood uh, full of gangs violent um, drug users. Um, you know we were just very ignored and I remember very early on when. I mentioned uh, Julian Castro was still mayor or had just become mayor and I remember there being a little bit of hey there's going to be a bond we need the votes for some you know project in the west side and I remember going knocking door to door and you know so many residents just they did they we even I couldn't comprehend it like what is it what what is it that they're doing is it like a little park and some benches and that's it because we were so used to empty promises and we were so used to being ignored and being looked at almost like trash, like Ugh, the West Side, you're the, you know. Um, and so little by little, I, I became more and more involved. And as the projects, you know, proceeded and, and we started getting things into fruition, we could see the actual changes in the neighborhood. And a good example is the Elmendorf Lake uh, Park. I will say my house was, you know, um, within a mile when we used to walk um, and, and, you, and at that time you really couldn't walk it was not safe it was not safe at all um and that's where also you you see a lot of why there's that childhood obesity because parents aren't going to let their kids walk around in neighborhoods where some they could see something dangerous or something dangerous can happen to them but i will say from my personal view i went from seeing a park that literally no families utilized. You wouldn't see people walking around. Um, a very vivid moment that I had remembered is seeing a gentleman. Um, unfortunately, he was on something and he couldn't even stand up. Okay, that's how bad it was. Now, and, and it fills my heart, after church on Sunday when I'm leaving uh, mass, I pass right by it and it is filled with children and families utilizing it. And I remember during the times when we would have the you know public input meetings, we still couldn't comprehend because we, the first and foremost thing was safety, 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 safety. So, you know, and what was told to us is when the people come, safety will come. And I was skeptical, I'll be honest, I was very skeptical about that. I was like, if people are walking around, that's gonna be, you know, 
but it actually worked. It, it really did. Um, having the people out, having people utilize the neighborhood, not only changed the, the crime level, I would say, but also just the sense of pride in your neighborhood. Um, just being able to say, yeah, I'm from the West side or, you know, being able to walk outside and do things with your family that we couldn't do before. So I'm very happy and proud of being part with Sarah for as long as I have been, I think a little over 10 years. Um, and so to be able to see that, that change has been a positive impact. just open it up for any questions the audience may have. Um, if there's any questions online, Sam, maybe you can ask us or let us know. But, you know, as students of environmental, um, urban and regional planning, you know, we, we're always constantly looking for ways to improve our community. Um, for some of the things that you've heard today, greenways are a great example of that. I also work for the San Antonio River Authority and we work in green infrastructure. And so looking at how we do that, you know, in greenways, um, improving, we're right out here. Uh, right out here is the San Antonio River. So you're able to have that connectivity. This space that we're in, Confluence Park, captures all of the rainwater. So it's, it's, a, it's a great um, confluence of a lot of different things. Were you gonna say something? No. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. <laughs> <No>. Thank you. <laughs> um, so please, uh, do you guys have questions? Sam, I know you've got plenty. As my cohort. <laughs> yeah, I guess I can start. I mean, I, I'm, I just wonder about like, um, I'm sure it takes a lot of coordination with landowners, you know, to do, build something like a brand loop, you know, so I'm wondering about like maybe um, how do rights of way kind of go about, you know, what, how do you coordinate with different people? I know it's probably a difficult oh, task, but what's like a, you know, kind of conversations that... Do you want me to take this? Sure, go ahead. I, I've painfully, I have experienced with that and sometimes it goes well and sometimes it doesn't um i would just say we have had some really great experiences with a lot of really generous folks who have donated property to the program uh especially near the rim uh and utsa in that area um we've had a lot of donations we every property between uh, the rim and Eisenhower Park was done through a donation with the exception of one, which we bought for Edwards Aquifer Protection and put the trail through through it. So, you know, we've had a lot of great, great experiences and made friends along the way with some of the landowners that we've uh, dealt with. Um, sometimes uh, it can be very difficult because we don't get responses from the landowners. There may be absentee landowners that don't even live in San Antonio. They don't even, some people don't even know they own the property. And so tracking them down is difficult. Um, some uh, are just out to see how much money they can get. Um, you know, so there's different things that go on. I would just say that the difficult ones can be very difficult and time consuming. And you know we're we're trying to stream that align that a little bit because I think the bond the 2020 bond that we're working off of has a little bit more stringent uh, schedule requirements that we stay on schedule more so we're trying to be a little bit more mechanical about that relationship instead of it being more organic which we would prefer but uh, it does take several years sometimes to make those land deals and um, it's just always a work in progress but as long as you kind of know the the Texas law and you know the basic steps a lot of it the rest of it really is just the art of relationship building thank you yeah Any other um i mean for, first off like um like in 2005 i moved away from san antonio i didn't come back for 17 years and, uh, and i've lived in lots of places that have greenways and that are, are you know older cities that you can walk so when I came back to San Antonio, I was still like, oh, I, it's my home, but I'm like, it's so backwards in terms of being able to, you know, go on greenways. But I didn't realize that all this had ha happened, like all the greenways. And so it, it's really inspiring. And I, I, I really applaud the city for sure. Um, but uh, in, in your, your statement about, you know, thinking about the 10 minute commute or, or, or cities. Uh, I just think about, I live on the north side and I love to ride my bike. And uh, I'm just wondering, like, how, how do we get involved? Like, I mean, I, I'm just thinking of my area, like, you know, there's uh, uh, 
you know, different parks. Uh, but yeah, how do you how do you how do you as a citizen engage with the city in like your particular area uh, for greenway or how how high? Is there an essay speak up? Yeah, well, there's that. Yeah, there's essay speak up, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, just contacting, you can contact me. Uh, Margarita Hernandez is here. She also works on the Greenways in San Antonio with me. And, um, you know, we can talk or, um, you know, there's other avenues. There's, you know, if we're building something in, in, in your neighborhood or near anywhere near your neighborhood, normally we put out information about that project and so forth. But if not, and you just want to have a conversation, we're open to that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I've drawn a blank, but I mean, you know, there's like McAllister and uh, Lawrence Creek, and it would be great to, I mean, but there's a lot of little creeks like that in our area, and I'm sure all over the city. And, uh, Can you send us an email? We'll share with you the, the map that we have okay. of the current trails that have been built, and the trails are in proposed condition. Either we are defining them or we are going to be designed. Um, and, and, or in partnerships with their county or with the state of River Authority. So you'll see all those uh, different trails playing, and you can see, because you mentioned Lawrence Creek, uh, you know, we are currently working on that Mud Creek Trail already. We have it, in, we've done the design, we're going to wait for the 2027 bond to do the construction. So, or in pair up with, with the county project. So we have different things that are in the works that we don't necessarily you know, share yeah, all the time, yeah. but they're on the website. Also, I want to remind everybody, uh, just because I attended the uh, walk and bike night at the NPO uh, Wednesday night, they are getting ready to do a second round, the, the bike uh, network plan, which is out of the transportation department in the city of San Antonio, they're getting ready to do a second round of public outreach. So that's your method also, right? To provide feedback and say, look, we're looking for safe bike lanes to be able to access the greenways or be able to access stores and you know, grocery stores, restaurants, key infrastructure that you know, will benefit communities. So that, that would be your, your way a mechanism that you can make your, your thoughts, put your thoughts there and request, um, you know, infrastructure. And then every year during the budget process, I know sometimes we're all so busy, you know, we work full days and then in the evening we're exhausted, but um, the budget process is also a good, good way that you can go and voice what you want to see out there, uh, what your tax dollars should be, spend, be spending on. I like uh, your, you mentioned Mud Creek, my girlfriend's father lives in that area right next to it. And you know, you talk to him and the people in the neighborhood because uh, you know, they don't view that as a resource. They're like, they're like fearful of it. But it sounds like there's some plan to make a better trail through it. And yes. I mean, like your, your comment about, and I, when I did my master's, I, I heard another story, this guy in Washington, D.C., but talk about reclaiming a park or areas and then they just magically become safer. I will say it's just showing up. Yeah. Um, I went from just being a resident, a citizen, and of course helping, you know, getting some of the votes for one of the bonds because there's a lot, a lot of entities can't have to come together to get this uh, done. Um, but just showing up and at that time, Really, back social media wasn't as as big as it is now. Um, that's how I was able to be, you know, get on the committee. However, now it's easier. You just go on, you know, Facebook or Instagram. You look up San Antonio River Authority, sign up, get emails, and they will email you when things. And what I've what one of the things I really enjoy, what I've I've expressed that I really like, is now we have a lot of hybrid meetings. So before it was all in person, that wasn't very convenient for people. I mean, I had a two year old at the time and I would lug her into the meetings literally in a car seat. Um, and now, you know, you can, you can voice your opinion from the comfort of your own home and just log in and kind of share what you, you know, what your thoughts are. But I will say that is the biggest challenge is getting people involved. We, 
I know Sarah's really good at sending postcards and emails and putting notices on public events. Um, but it's it's also a matter of people have actually being interested and in kind of coming in. Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking about my girlfriend and father and the people in that neighborhood. I mean, they, there's probably a plan for it, but they have no idea about it, and um, it, it would make the yeah, I mean, normally we don't start having a lot of real conversations with people until the money's on the table right. and we're ready to start actually doing some design. But when that when that happens and we're ready to move forward with the project, then we will be engaging the, the homeowners associations, all the board, like the boards of the homeowners associations, going to their meetings, having our own public meetings and sharing some of that information out. So if it's, you know, the neighborhoods surrounding Mud Creek, we, that is on the books and that's something that we're gonna be working with those HOAs on. It's just a matter of time. And I'll share a quick story. I know we're all pressed for time. Just really quick. I used to work in public work, right? Heavy infrastructure and engineers, school boats, everything that we could build with stuff. And um, we never had like residents that would come and say, yay for public works. Mm -hmm. uh, you could have like five people in that room and they all wanted to kill you, you know? <laughs> and one thing that I, coming here to parks and working under Brandon that I, that I saw that, you know, they did a good job in building trust with the community. And we have a resident, right, that goes to some of the meetings where people don't want the project. They're like, no. You're going to bring crime. There's all these people going to be, you know, snooping in my backyard. And then this resident comes, and he used to be an HOA president in a, a, a private neighborhood where the trail went through the back, right? And immediately those residents were like, oh, not in my backyard, but through conversations and working with Brandon and, you know, having that plan and, and giving information, this man comes to our meeting to say, look, I, I can tell you, I can vouch for the city's parks department that when they commit to working with the community, they work with them and, and ensure that the project is done, you know, mindfully and that it, it, it is a good project, right? He shares that they were all skeptical. They thought all this crime was coming to their neighborhood with, you know, the, the trail being in back. He said it never, it never, it never materialized. People that walk there are people that are utilizing the right way and it is true the, the time that you activate a space it is when the crime decreases when the dumping decreases and so it, it is a positive and um, until they see it right but once they hear it from a peer of theirs you know it's different and Brian and I get up there we can say all we want but once one of them one of their neighbors says well I can vouch for that and, and Brian has been really good in building a program like that yeah, thank you so much for sharing. That was a perfect note to end on. You guys get involved. Um, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add on that the oversight committee for the project, you know, was involved it, with the idea, development, vision, study, feasibility planning. And now that we're into design, we um, really in, rely on them to help provide a voice from the community to inform the project on what are people interested in. Um, we hosted a public information session about uh, recreational features that are going to complement the project and what the community would like to see in terms of where we might have needed connectivity access points. Um, and we're fortunate to have an active oversight committee to, to stay invo involved and engaged throughout the process. And for more information about the Westside Creeks project, we have um, an, a website you can stay informed. It's westsidecreeks.com on the screen perfect and so and we have those oversight committee meetings are open to the public as well so every month uh the third tuesday at six o'clock in the river authority boardroom so if you want to um, come learn more about the project and how you know community organizing engagement works welcome to join us awesome thank you so much so now we'd like to do the quick raffle sam's going to do it online yeah you already did it you're yeah. awesome yeah. <laughs> very cool will you announce the winner Kenya. Kenya Kenya. Felder. Congrats, Kenya. congratulations she's one of our classmates so awesome thanks for joining whoops and does everybody in here have a ticket okay let's pass out the rest of these guys we're going to raffle in here while we're doing that we'd like to say thank you for your questions well, yeah. with the, with the river authority um medal medal 
And we'll we'll give one to Margarita as well. Yes, Margarita. Thank you. And here's for Kenya. <laughs> Margarita, you get one for for being involved and asking questions and giving giving us more information. Everybody else? Everybody got their raffle? One more, one more. Dun 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 drum roll. Anybody else have any other thoughts while we wrap this up? Oh, big thank you, um, Bob, online. Let me see if I can get you to be sharing your screen now so we can see you. Thank you so much for saying that. The one of our... Okay. Yes, yes. I'm just going to try to show, show your screen. That can be frightening. <laughs> <laughs> um, exit. Where is exit? Does anybody know? Aha. Ha, ha, ha. All right, where is it? The bar at the top, maybe? So show, yeah, maybe show. I guess I don't need to talk into this. No, show sharing. video, stop sharing, that's a great idea. Oh, we are stopped sharing. Nope, stop share. There you go. Yay, there you are, Bob. I think we hey, did. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I see my fellow panelists. You guys are great. It was such a pleasure to have you. We're going to be raffling your your book now. Uh, gallery, thank you. Gallery, awesome. Okay, who wants to pick? Should you pick? Okay, our guest. And you're like, don't drop the winning ticket on the ground. <laughs> Would you like to do the honors? Sure. <laughs> I'll try. Um, three three nine three three five three. Karen, yay! Congratulations! Thank you. Yay! Okay, you guys are welcome to hang out, have some more food, um, have some drinks, talk to our guests. Thank you again for coming out. It was such a pleasure to have you. Yay!